on this episode of Edge of the Web. This this marketing axiom that I love so much, uh, be clear, not clever, be different, not better. I'm just, I love that. I think it's just such a simple thing. You do that in everything that you do and it will work from a marketing perspective. It will work. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. Hey, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios located in downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Every week we're bringing you the latest trends in digital marketing and marketing influencers from around the world. So check out all of our recent recent shows over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, the, the title sponsor of the show is Site Strategics, uh, your digital marketing pioneers specializing in the agile marketing strategy and execution. So if you're interested in what that is from, 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 and how that's different from any other digital marketing, go over to sitestrategics.com. That's S-I-T-E strategics.com and just uh, have a talk with us. Uh, schedule an appointment and we can kind of break down what it means uh, to be agile, but on top of that, what it means to be results driven. And that's all the difference in the world. I'm I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. I'm the founder and CEO of Site Strategics and Edge Media Studios. The reason that we do this show, uh, we talk about it every time we get into our show, is is we're it's twofold. Actually, it's not only a marketing, I would be as transparent as possible. It's not only a marketing execution. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're in the space and, and contributing into the digital uh, uh, digital uh, advertising and marketing dynamics out there. But uh, on top of it, we're also bringing, we're kind of demystifying everything that we do on this show on a regular basis. Demystifying uh, uh, tactics uh, like search engine optimization, social media, marketing and management, conversion rate optimization, video optimization, all these things that are there that, that can be very well elusive. And we talk to the top practitioners of these tactics around the world. And we're blessed to be able to have um, a, a continual growth of, of visibility. And it only uh, it can be done by, by you, the audience, being able to lift us up and be able to share us with uh, your respective tribes. So we really appreciate that. The second reason, maybe the third reason, if I'm counting, that we do this is to keep our powder dry as a digital marketing firm. We want to be able to learn and, and, and pay attention to the cutting edge trends. See what I did there? Uh, <laughs> it's 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 a space in which we have to continually uh, focus on what's happening on a regular basis. That's why we do what we do. So we got Tom Broadbeck uh, alongside me. He's the director of digital media here at Site Strategics. Tom, how you doing, sir? Hey, I'm over here in the control room. There today. he is. Hi. Hi. How you doing, sir? Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Now you can if you bring the mic closer. Yeah, we'll bring the mic a little bit closer there. So hi, hi everybody. Hi. So and over here today. Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. Sometimes, evidently, I smell, the, so you're going to be in the production. Get relocated to the Harry Potter production room. <laughs> uh, we also have our, our guest with us. I want to introduce to our audience Jeremiah Smith, president and CEO of Simple Tiger. Sir, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Dude, you've got the best background of any <laughs> guest we've ever had on our show. What's up? Thank with you. That? you know, you're more than <laughs> welcome. You. Appreciate it. I like to keep it simple, nice and orange. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. Well, you know what? I'm actually going to mute my computer so we can keep on going. Um, Jeremiah, we're, we'd love to have you on board and talk about some of the latest digital marketing news. What do you think? Passionate about the subject. I'd love to talk to you about that today. Sweet. Well, let's check out what's happening around the world in digital marketing. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. Okay, hey, first on on the on the uh, chopping block here is, is an article at uh, Marketing Land by Amy Gaston Hughes. Uh, Facebook gives more than fifty publishers access to the breaking news label. The site uh, first rolled out as breaking news indicator in a test run last November. It included a small number of local and national publishers. So breaking news. Hey, why we haven't been given that breaking news uh, uh, designation, have we? <laughs> 
Nope. No, no, we haven't. We uh, we tend not to break the news, like, apparently. Oh, we're breaking we're, news right now. Gonna, we're breaking. It's kind of like Inception. News, we're breaking, breaking news about oh. the breaking breaking news <laughs> tag. No, anybody? Well, Facebook is actually making another attempt to fine tune the way its users consume news articles. Last November, the site gave a small group of local and national publishers the ability to include a breaking news label on their story. Starting today. Facebook is actually expanding the breaking news label test run to more than 50 additional publishers in North America, Latin America, Europe, and Australia. Uh, Joey Ryu, uh, actually, the, the Facebook product manager, said the, if the expansion is successful, we may actually add some more publishers. According to the announcement, publishers will access will have access to the label, and they can actually include it in the instant articles, mobile web uh, links and Facebook Live videos. Facebook says publishers can actually use the label once a day. Wow, just once a day. Uh, but we'll have an extra pool of up to five indicators per month, and can and choose. They can actually choose to use it uh, or have it included on a story for up to six hours. All right. So breaking news. We're breaking the news right here. What do you think, Jeremiah? Well, I think it's interesting that they're rolling this out. I, I immediately start asking myself why. That's like my favorite question. It may be the philosopher in me. But I have a strong feeling that uh, part of the reason why they're rolling out this feature is there's there tends to be a delay effect when somebody shares some news information on Facebook with uh, how relevant it is, temporally speaking. You know, if, if something actually is happening today and I share it on Facebook to my friends, and then maybe a few days from now, one of my friends takes it and says, oh, my gosh, this is crazy that this is happening. And then they share it. Uh, there may be a delay in terms of like how, how relevant or how recent it is. And I'm sure Facebook wants to kind of tighten that up as they move into this kind of like live video era. So, no, absolutely. And, and you, you almost you can almost envision that it's going to be a, a highly um, uh, a requested label, and they're going to use it sparingly and, and divvy it out sparingly because everybody can't have breaking news, right? Mm -hmm. So the the publishers, uh, the, the concern here is they, are, with this new advent, they're also going to be deciding who gets to break news, who doesn't, and we also understand political perspectives of some of these so, these these the media platforms, right? Right. Are right. there uh, are some of the uh, more right-winging, right-wing-leaning uh, 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 broadcaster is going to be able to get the same type of tag. Not to, not to stir that up, but uh, I mean, it, is that going to be available for, to them? I mean, it's their sandbox, right? Sure. Yeah, it is their sandbox, and I think at the end of the day, we always have to ask ourselves: when a company this size does something, what is the motivation? And 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 I always like to assume that it probably has a financial component to it. So <laughs> I think that's a safe, a safe assertion. And yeah. uh, I, I, I have to deal with that all the time with Google specifically. So um, I get to see that play out in the real world uh, with my daily job. But yeah. I think, yeah, with Facebook, it's going to be interesting to see how this works, maybe perhaps helping to establish a stronger trust in Facebook as a source medium for, or not a, not a source medium, but a medium through which people read source information from mm -hmm. the news, mm -hmm. you know, and help increase that brand trust perhaps. No, 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 that's very astute. Um, thoughts there, Tom? Hi. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the pay, for the delay there. Uh, thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, it would be interesting. I was kind of thrown by it, I guess. It really caught my eye. I noticed it. I don't remember the exact news article now, uh, but it was probably about a week ago or so when I first saw it mm -hmm. uh, being deployed, and it really caught my eye. So, I mean, I guess that's that's good for Facebook. Um, but, no, it would be I, – I, I, I'm not sure about the, the one-day – or one time per day use of the label. Um, I'm you gotta, not sure. You got to pick your story. Yeah, you got to pick your story. So, <laughs> um, yeah, because I mean, I, I it'll be interesting to see how it works. But working in the news industry, that's where I came from. Everything's breaking news, and so they'll want, they yeah. will they will abuse it. Yeah. So I'm right. glad that there is a uh, um, there's a buffer on it too. No, you're absolutely right. Um, second article uh, that we wanted to focus on uh, from Mix. Uh, the author's actually mixed. It's so on the next web. Researchers find 50,000 WordPress websites encrypted with the cryptocurrency mining malware. So, Tom, you want to dive into this article? Sorry. Oops, sorry. I started talking again. In my <laughs> I guess that's a lot of things to click. Uh, yeah, so cryptocurrency, we talked a little bit about it yesterday. We haven't really touched the sh subject, but uh, apparently I'm not, and I don't know a lot about cryptocurrency. Yep. Uh, but cryptocurrency, 
apparently, uh, the way they use it, they can hack uh, some WordPress websites. And so this uh, this organization found nearly 50,000 websites that have been infected with crypto jacking scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a bad packets report. Uh, he says relying on source code uh, from the search engine p public www to scan web pages for running crypto jacking malware. Uh, they were able to identify at least 48,953 affected websites, and uh, 7,300 of those sites were powered by WordPress. So uh, they have a list. Uh, let's see if I can remember where the link is. Um, there's, a, there's a link in here, and we'll put it in the show notes too, that, has, mm -hmm. that lists out every single website that has been hacked uh, by the cryptocurrency hack oh, wow. bug. So you can see if your website's on the list and take it take care accordingly. More more importantly, if they can find uh, and provide what plugins are being uh, exploited to be able to do sure. that. Um, I think that would be in incredibly valuable. Um, so, thoughts about cryptocurrency? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit trail. Oh uh, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the cryptocurrency game and everything that's going on there. I'm more so, more so interested, I think, in the in the um, blockchain technology and that underlying underlying foundation that that kind of underpinning technology to how we're going to see that play out in the future in so many different industries in so many different ways. Absolutely. I'm excited about not that. just from a monetization, not just from not a currency totally. standpoint, but this is. This is open source. I mean, it, it comes from it, it's its parent is open source and open open source uh, 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 programming. Right now, you right. have open source uh, decentralization of of great not only content but also standardization. Right. Yeah. Is, I mean, I I read an article uh, I think a couple of weeks ago that said something about the three greatest inventions in the past 2000 years. And one of them kind of went by unnoticed. And the first one was double entry accounting. Mm -hmm. The second one was the internet because of its connectedness of everyone globally. And yep. then the third one was triple entry accounting, which is the blockchain system. Um, it, it's absolutely staggering. I don't think enough people fully understand what's going on in that right now. No, no. The, the breadth. I, I think I think you're right there, and and that is a, a, a gateway to a heck of a lot of protection mm -hmm. uh, around the world that is no longer cre uh, controlled by governments, no longer controlled by corporations. Um, the people are going to be in charge and, and can control and checking on themselves with this group dynamic, this network of of assurance, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, cool. it's really exciting. Any kind of democratization like that's always exciting yeah. and interesting because it's kind of a Pandora's box. We don't really know. <laughs> and know scary what as get hell, too. It. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, uh, anyway, that's a whole other sh series of shows right there, to be honest. Right. <laughs> Uh, on PC Mag from Sasha Sagan, uh, T-Mobile's LAA creates screaming fast speeds in NYC. So check this out: is that uh, T-Mobile is now boosting LTE download speeds to over 500 megabytes per second by using licensed assisted access LAA in New York City, according to Milan. Milanovic, uh, technical evangelist for UCLA. Boy, that was a sentence and a half. Um, this, this is the first time we've actually been able to see and test commercial LAA in the U.S. The technology, which, which has been heard of uh, for about a year now, pipes 4G LTE signals over an unused 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi channel. Ah, dude, all right. To be able to widen a carrier's available uh, carriers uh, available bandwidth for carriers other than Sprint, LAA will be critical to achieving gigabyte LTE speeds because they don't have enough contiguous license spectrum to achieve those speeds. So we're we're governed by the actual spectrum, but with a piggyback of broadcast to a, a gigabyte, uh, five gigahertz uh, uh, delivery mechanism, you're literally about to uncap. Delivery speeds. Could you ever imagine that we're right on the precipice to be able to have that type of lightning speed yeah. in the palm of our hands? Yeah, it would be crazy to have faster internet on your phone, right, than I do yeah. at my house. <laughs> like, I thought I would never see the day. Oh, my but, gosh. Yeah, apparently it's closer, coming pretty soon. LAA. So. Uh, there you mm -hmm. go. What do you think, Jeremiah? <laughs> Uh, a couple different directions that could go. I mean, first things first, I think with the with the uh, constant um, increase, the velocity of increase of, of tech 
technological advancement in media. So going from 1080p to 4K, um, going from you know just just media size and what that takes, you mm -hmm. know, streaming video and things like that. This is kind of a requirement when you think about it. You know, I mean, if we're all Snapchatting each other all the freaking time, and then we're gonna we're about to go from you know HD to 4K, yep. we're just gonna have to have that connectivity to continue having a normal experience. You know, that's where we have like real first world problems start erupting in cities like New York, where we, we're not able to Snapchat our 4K videos or FaceTime 4K video fast enough. That's right. driving me nuts, right? So right. I think things like that are where you're gonna have to have that technology first of all. Second of all, I don't want to stir the pot again on another rabbit trail here, but I'm interested to see how net neutrality affects us. Oh, see, run. yeah, beat me to it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because you cannot. This is a you you you've got you supply and demand, and you have a demand for faster and faster tech, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot. Well, I'll show my cards here. You cannot uh, hamstring carriers to have to provide that supply without right. cost, without transactions. This is a right. brand new environment. And on top of that, as everything builds towards more and more video content, right, mm -hmm. you, the carriers have to be able to charge for a structure that, that gives, gives them the ability to subsidize some of this, this demand growth, right? Sure, sure. At least a reasonable rate. Yeah. I mean, I totally understand. I mean, you know, you can't uh, you can't tell a railroad company, you know, way back in the 1800s to build these railroads for free because the whole country has to use them. But you also shouldn't be gouging us when right. you're charging us for how we're using it. So there's got to be something in there, some line that we can agree on. Mm -hmm. And this is all new territory as well, because never mm -hmm. has has communication needed this type of support. And there's so much innovation that's happening and somebody's got to pay for it. You, the consumer right. cannot expect that all this magically happens. <laughs> right, right. Although it feels like it, you buy a new iPhone and bam, it does magically happen. Yeah, doesn't it does. It? <laughs> but you know what magically happens in your inbox each and every week? That's our Edge of the Web newsletter that comes to you, pipe full of great digital gold. How about that segue? Was that a good one? I love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so if you want to sign up for what's happening on the show each and every week, go over to the number just, I mean, on your smartphone. You know you have it with you. Don't drive and do this, but pull over. Pull over right now. Uh, text to the number 22828, the word Edge Talk, and you can start signing up for your, our newsletter right there. Go over to Edge of the Web Radio to be able to just fill out uh, your email. We'll never use it for any other reason except for sending you information about what we're doing on the show, the news articles that we talked about, as well as who we will soon be interviewing, as well as we'll throw in something unique for our, our, our VIP members, and that's who you are who are subscribing to the newsletter. So jump in there at edgeofthewebradio.com to be able to sign up right now. All right, follow all the featured trending topics over at edgeofthewebradio.com. So for right now, let's, uh, let's deep dive uh, with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Jeremiah Smith, co-founder and CEO of Simple Tiger. The deep voice guy brought Jeremiah to us. Uh, so how about that, Jeremiah? Love it. That's a fantastic voice. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know what? Hey, uh, for our audience that doesn't know Simple Tiger or Jeremiah Smith, he's the president, CEO, and part owner of Simple Tiger. He started Simple Tiger in 2007 where, where he could do consulting on nights and weekends. But uh, his brother came along, Sean, later and joined him, and they decided to turn it into an agency. Where do you hearken from, Jeremiah? So, so I'm originally born and raised from Atlanta, Georgia. Cool. Hot Lana. Uh, but right now I am reporting to you live from Sar sunny Sarasota, Florida, and it is beautiful outside. <laughs> Sweet. So um, why don't you unpack your, your backstory real quick uh, and how you came to first jump into search engine optimization? Sure. That sounds good. Yeah. So previously I used to build websites for clients and uh, the very first client that I built a big website for, um, they, they really needed ongoing marketing help. And so uh, after I got this site built, I showed it to them and they were like, yeah, we'd love this site. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. Uh, we want it to show up in Google. Can you do that? And I was like, hmm, 
I don't know. I've never even thought about that. And so I looked into it, I Googled it, you know, and I discovered that there's this whole underground uh, industry called search engine optimization. And so after I found search engine optimization, I started teaching myself a couple of the, the techniques and the things that it would take to get this site to perform well. And I told them, I'm like, look, just let me work on this site. Uh, I'll get it into Google, but it's going to take a lot more work than you think. But I actually have a strong feeling that there's a lot of value we could get out of this. So uh, we went with that. And uh, six months later, there their company had blown up from all the efforts that we had done from an SEO perspective that uh, I was absolutely sold. I was done building websites. I was done doing anything else. I was completely invested in search engine optimization. So I put that on my resume and I went out and got a job at a big ad agency in Atlanta learned the ropes on how to do SEO for enterprise companies like uh, NBC, MTV, E-Trade, LG Electronics, Sports Illustrated, like just a, a bunch of Fortune 500 companies, right? And uh, after doing it for them and for the small mom and pop shop prior, I saw that everything's really the same. It's kind of a level playing field. Um, it's it, it just, you know, the bigger companies have bigger budgets, they do more. Uh, that's really the only difference. So, um, I was really interested in that. Decided this is it for me. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this as a consultant, and then uh, over time, obviously, it turned into an agency, and now we've got a full team spread out throughout the U.S. Sometimes around the world because we're all remote, so our our people travel a lot and everything uh, while they work. And uh, yeah, I just absolutely love what I do. SEO has changed a lot in the past twelve years, but uh, it's always been fun. That's a great backstory, and uh, that's where that's where you hear some fantastic uh, um, entrepreneurs get their start. They uh, they literally realize that it's not uh, a field of dreams. You build a website, it will uh, they'll show up and buy from you. You know, right, and right. as as basic as that sounds, there was a lot going on 15, 20 years ago in the in the in the in the web build space that literally. Marketing companies just thought this was a piece of collateral that matched right. their other collateral, right? Right, right, yeah. And I still I still get people every once in a while with that frame of thinking. Um, the type of clientele that we target nowadays are mainly software as a service companies, and they totally understand mm -hmm. SEO. Um, so we don't have to kind of explain this to them. But a lot of companies out there still think that SEO falls in line with any other kind of advertising or any type of advertising. But I'm constantly having to tell people it is not apples to apples advertising. Advertising, yeah. you know, you you have an ad run out there, and, and you get a result from that ad. You do something from SEO, you may or may not get a result from that one thing. It's a complex system of stuff that has to happen, um, and it, there's so many moving parts, and they've just got to work together really well. It's it's a reverse engineering uh, a whole company's intellectual property. Specifically, I'm talking about Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's yeah. actually what we're doing all day. And so. they hide the cheese on you all the time. I'm hey, sure uh, speaking of ads, I'm going to have to uh, put a gratuitous plug in for Site Strategics, who is our title sponsor. So so bear with me here, Jer uh, Jeremiah. Site Strategics is actually proud to be the title sponsor of Edge of the Web and wanted to share with us listeners uh, – of the show, a special offer. So we we hear uh, uh, Site Strategics create uh, digital marketing strategies on a regular basis, and we're constantly asked the question about return on investment. That's truly what you should be focused on with any marketing firm, right? Well, would you like to discover what your marketing ROI is? Why, why not have a second opinion to check out your current investment and see if that investment's paying off? We're actually offering a 30% discount off of our digital marketing ROI report. We actually learn your digital strengths, weaknesses, and threats. The digital marketing report delivers a comprehensive image of the existing performance in areas of SEO, social media, social marketing, and allows us, the, the Site Strategics team, to produce uh, a full insight into opportunities for growth. So check it all out. We do a SEO audit, social media review, paid marketing review, conversion rate analysis, competitor analysis, and gap analysis. Uh, if you are interested in that, uh, simply go over to offer.sitestrategics.com forward slash edge, and you can jump in right there. There's no obligation. It's just to get the, the conversation started. You can certainly uh, jump into the, the Facebook comment stream and be able to see that link right there. But, hey, just have a conversation with us. And uh, if you want to get a kind of second opinion on how your digital marketing is paying off for you, uh, just, just check it out right there. All right. There's a gratuitous plug. Jeremiah, thanks so much for uh, uh, giving away to that. Uh, let's jump into the future of search, if you would, especially SEO as it comes down to voice search and robots. 
Yeah, yeah, please, let's do that. <laughs> so, I, so I hear so much going on right now about voice search and so many questions about, about what this means. Uh, I, I kind of want to roll it back just a little bit from voice search to, a, to a, an important element we need to understand first before we get into voice search, which mm -hmm. is uh, the, the results pages in search. So whenever you go to Google and you type in a search, uh, whatever comes up, that's your results page. Um, nowadays, we have this kind of featured snippet or rich snippet thing that's been going on, and it's much more popular nowadays where you've got just a single answer right. at the top of the page, and then you've got a lot of results that come up underneath that. Uh, lately, people would say things like, maybe you could just ask Google, what time is it? Or uh, when is Easter? That kind of thing. And it'll give you a single result. Um, recently, like within the past couple of days, Google rolled out an update where that rich snippet is all that comes up if you ask the right kind of query, such as, what is two plus two? You know, they'll say two plus two equals four. And then there'll be a button that says, show more results. Uh, because they don't want to just show you a whole bunch of listings and everything. They're just going to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that that makes Google very useful and everything. I think that's awesome. It makes it nice, clean, incredible assistant to a degree to answer questions like that. But people in the SEO community and uh, marketers, they're, they're always yelling SEO is dead. They're always freaking out that it's the end of the world for search engine optimization. Google just launched this thing. It's going to wipe out SEO, that kind of stuff. But we, we really need to slow down a little bit with those kinds of assertions. It's a little crazy because Google is trying to provide this answer solution benefit as um, as just a, another reason you should continue using Google, not as a, a means to a business end. Because for example, if we do a search in Google for two plus two, uh, the result comes up, but there aren't any ads that come up. Mm -hmm. Why don't any ads come up? Well, because there's no commercial benefit to offering an ad around the question, what is two plus two, right? What kind of commercial benefit is there? Oh, to hold on, to that? hold on. If you're a Khan Academy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if there's math equations that are coming through, Khan Academy mm -hmm. could very well be there to be able to help guide that user over to, hey, uh, join us over here and be able to improve your math scores. Kari, I mean, two plus two Perhaps. is kind of ba basic. Sure, but sure, sure. But you're absolutely on the right track. And we just had to talk about this uh, yesterday regarding mm -hmm. this new utilization or this utility that Google's providing. They're cleaning out all of the other results and just answering the question. That's what you're talking right. about, right? Right, right, right. And, and really what I'm getting at there is that there may be cases where, uh, like the example that you gave, where a result yields an ad because it is relevant. But we have to keep in mind that when we look at whatever Google's market capitalization is, a good 90 plus percent of that market capitalization, however, many billions of dollars are worth at the time have to do with the advertising revenue they make on search results. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep that in mind. I don't think Google's just going to flip a switch one day and say, you know what, we're done making money. We're just going <laughs> to answer questions from now on for free. Good right. luck. You know, I don't think that's going to happen, right? So we're going to still see commercial benefit coming out of Google for Google. Right. And if you know that, you know kind of where to look that certain queries are going to quit yielding the results that actually yield commercial benefit to us marketers and people that have websites in Google, but other queries are still going to offer those benefits. And we have to keep that in mind. People aren't always going to be, you know, this is where I take the step and go from talking about rich snippets and a single answer now into the voice realm. Mm -hmm. People aren't always going to be searching using voice. Voice is like a keyboard or a mouse. It's an input methodology. And the result that you get is a, is a spoken uh, result, which people don't always want to hear an answer, you know, like I can, I can ask my computer all kinds of questions, but sometimes I just don't want to, <laughs> I would rather look at an answer. I'd rather look at a result. So we have to keep that in mind that it's just enhancing our experience and our utilization of the machine. It's not replacing our experience. Absolutely. Or and on top of that, you can only do that in a certain area. You can't be doing voice search in the middle of, uh, uh corporate cubes, right? I mean, right. I mean, there's a time and place. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so I think adoption for voice search is going to be interesting to watch because it is a new technology. I think it is a little bit unclear where exactly voice search is going to go because it is also going to kind of be a little bit of a cultural shift to a degree. You know, it took a little while for people to start using mice when they came out. I mean, uh, things like that are, are going to have the adoption curve element to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think new children nowadays that first interact with a phone and see that you can ask it questions are just going to understand that there are some times that you're just going to ask your phone questions. And there are other times you're actually going to play around and, and dig into stuff. So. No, absolutely. And uh, for those who you who are watching on the live stream, dig into this conversation and, and ask Jeremiah some questions. We're certainly monitoring that right now. Uh, regarding voice search, the... The single answer result that's coming from the home devices, right? So the battles mm -hmm. with, between 
between Alexa and uh, or the or the Echo and uh, the Google Home device for the most part. Apple mm-hmm. just just didn't make it. <laughs> didn't right. make it there. <laughs> Poor Apple man, that was just un- so badly played. Yeah. Um, but uh, when you're looking for an answer and you're asking a question, right? Mm-hmm. You're looking for a single answer. And the propensity or the, the possibility of it being monetized and be having that answer and being delivered to you from an advertiser as opposed to what's the best match. I mean, mm-hmm. that is a scary proposition because, one, um, you're getting such advocacy from Google, right? Mm-hmm. Where does Google align itself with, with delivering a, a, a non-monetized result as opposed to what it very well could be, uh, the only result that Google's going to give you and you're going to act upon that, man, that's, that's a, it's, it's, it's not monopolization, but it's pretty darn close uh, right. being the resource of, of, of all information as opposed to being able to search from a desktop and be able to discern at the consumer level, right? Sure, sure. Well, I think we we still kind of have to go back to we kind of have to go back to this interesting dichotomy that Google's going to experience, which is, you know, they set off they set out for their mission objective to be to organize the world's information and make it publicly accessible for everyone. Um, I appreciate that. I mean, that's a nice, clear, simple mission uh, to understand conceptually. But at the end of the day, they're they're a for profit corporation, so they're going to have to find a way to do that and make money at it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that said, so first of all, they can deliver the world's information in a way where they're not gonna offer any commercial benefit when you ask a question like, when is Easter or what is two plus two? Those answers don't necessarily need to com- you know, carry any kind of commercial benefit to Google or to anyone else for that matter. But that could be a lost leader in, in terms of uh, you know a business and corporate lingo. A lost leader is something that you do for free to offer value to someone so that they utilize the other parts of what you offer for for profit. Um, So I think that's one of those things that's just going to make people want to use Google more and more Mm -hmm. um, and and enjoy interacting with it. While the commercial components of Google are still going to be there and still going to be viable. You know, when I start looking around for like best HVAC company in Sarasota, for example, um, Google might end up serving up one result and that one result might be skewed by Google reviews Mm -hmm. or something along those lines. Um, Or it could be the the highest paid you know, advertisement at the time. But I think the Google being who they are going to have to find ways to, uh, at least in a nuanced way, um, prove to you that this is an advertisement. And they've always kind of done that. I think that's part of the whole FTC requirements or FCC requirements around advertising and things like that. Mm-hmm. You can't, you got to be careful about native advertising and that kind of stuff and, and be very clear when it's very, you know, uh, you know, a commercial advertisement for something. So I think that that is actually where we start getting into a little bit more artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. the distinction between the types of answers that you're going to be getting. Uh, If Google can quickly tell that you're asking for an answer to a calculation, the artificial intelligence will probably look at a couple of different indicators, not just the organic results of what's coming up and the actual answer that, that, you know, people are constantly looking for and clicking on in organic results, but also what kind of paid benefit is Google experiencing? Like, uh, are those paid advertisers really seeing any good click-through rate? Or are users just not interacting with those ads? Because if they're not interacting with those ads, Google may decide to shut those ads down yep. and lose a little bit of money, take a little bit of money off the table to increase the experience for their users in order to have deeper buy-in of Google as, a, as an adopted brand by yeah. users. Yeah, so absolutely. that's, that's kind of what I think. You're absolutely right. And... Google turning itself into a utility mm-hmm, of, right. of not only research, but also transactions. I mean, we're seeing a heck of a lot in the playing field on the desktop and the mobile experience from uh, Google jumping in and actually giving the ability to not only call, but also ask for a quote. These, these new functions that are starting mm-hmm. to move in the space where no longer is the, is the consumer having uh, Google as a guidepost of best relevancy, but actually Google as the transaction spot. Uh, and mm-hmm. with Google Home and the, these these spaces, it's it's invariably going to uh, continue that way, and, and they got to be very careful of their brand. They can't mm-hmm. they can't plaster it with 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 ads just to just for the almighty dollar. And they're in a space now that you're absolutely right. They're they're going to mm-hmm. make decisions based on what's to the consumer benefit. Um, take us down the road of uh, AI and machine learning and how companies could actually, uh, and brands, take advantage of that. 
Sure. Yeah. Well, I think, and, and I wanted to touch on something real quick that you you had mentioned there about having that transactional component that Google had. And then I want to get into the AI thing and, yep. and how people can adapt to that, because that's a really important subject. But in regards to having that transactional component in Google, I think the big threat to Google, a lot of people have been talking about other search engines for years now. The big threat to Google nowadays is actually Amazon. They're doing an incredible job Amen of this. They've already done an incredible job of laying the foundational groundwork of a transactional environment and a transactional just foundation uh, of, of how Amazon operates all the way to, I mean, they've got their pro services division. They've got Prime Video. They've got uh, you know Amazon Music. Uh, they've got all these different other things outside of just buying product retail through Amazon that they are now in control of. And now they've got the he mo one of the most heavily adopted voice engagement interfaces out there with the, with the Echo and things like that. So um, I, I think that knowing that ought to make us as... SEO professionals and, and anybody doing search engine optimization or wanting to get in the industry, think a little bit broader than just Google because it's so easy to get stuck in the ways of Google. And I've thought about this for years as I've worked with companies that are launching an iPhone app. You know, When you launch your iPhone app and you get it in the Apple store, uh, the Apple store has a search engine. And it doesn't work like Google. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got its own rules and everything. And you can game that search engine just like you can yep. game Google, right? So we have to think about that with Amazon too. So that's just something I want to throw out there for your users. Just keep in mind uh, about that. Now, in, in regards to the artificial intelligence side of things, though, I think how we see artificial intelligence uh, playing into search specifically, we always have to keep in mind, uh, we go back to the basics and ask that big philosophical question, why? Why artificial intelligence? Uh, artificial intelligence, in, in my mind, is so that we can we can leverage better utilization of a form of thinking than having to have a whole bunch of people think uh, or or one person think. Uh, we can we can leverage a stronger capability to think for ourselves uh, outside of ourselves. I really think that's that's the idea with artificial intelligence. So really, at the end of the day, it's not trying to outdo us in any way, in so much as it's trying to actually help us and offer up something better. Right. So I think we have to keep that in mind, especially as SEO people working within Google and we see things like artificial intelligence and we see the effects of it kind of coming against a lot of our previous efforts in SEO. And we think artificial intelligence almost has this connotation of nemesis right now in the SEO industry, but it is absolutely not. I want to ensure everyone who is doing SEO the right way that if you've been doing it the right way all along, artificial intelligence is about to be your best friend. Because what it's going to start doing is it's going to start learning the patterns that have actually pleased companies' users for years and years and are actively pleasing those users right now with content engagement and all kinds of deep analytics, clickstream analytics, and things like that, to where these search engines are going to get a lot smarter about what content is actually good, what websites are actually usable, and stuff like that. So hmm. we're going to start seeing better results. I mean, one of our clients, we actually had two clients that were hit by a core algorithmic update here recently, and we were looking at the increase in rankings for some of their keywords and the decrease in ranking for some of their keywords. And I was looking at the change between those two. Why did they increase or why did they decrease in such a large swing? And as I was analyzing them, I looked at what URLs the client site changed for. So this URL chain, you know, like we, we searched this one keyword and this old URL used to show up, but now this new URL shows up. That was interesting, the, mm. the switch out of URLs. And I noticed that lo and behold, like some clients might've gotten a hit from it, for example, but I was looking at the results and I was like, all right, subjectively, it's probably bad for our client. They dropped in the rankings, but objectively, it's actually a much better result that they're serving up now. And so I saw that and I'm like, I like to see that. Mm -hmm. That means Google is getting better. That means mm -hmm. it's going to be a better search engine. So let's serve up better results. Let's serve up better content. Yeah. 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 And uh, well said, uh, uh, Jeremiah, the, the AI component, it, you know, you, you gotta you gotta make sure that you uh, tell our listeners and 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 also uh, assure me that AI is not going to be turning into Skynet. Right. Right. <laughs> I can't assure you of that. Man. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> but it is the the evolution of AI is 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 first it was Bayesian uh, technology, Bayesian statistics on in in the the. the um, you know, the concept of providing you content based on your previous decisions, right? Mm -hmm. 
That's where that's where the engines were developing. Uh, it's their their footing, and now they've gotten into the space of being an assistant, just like you're talking about. Right. And you got to look at AI and and the development in, inside of inside of search as being not a hindrance, but a a utilization that uh, these these firms are providing to its con- their, their their respective consumers. Now, mm-hmm. uh, we also talked, Tom, if if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, from our friend over at uh, uh, Yext, uh, William t- Forrester. Yeah, William Forrester. Yep. Uh, we 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 talked about um, that next level of concierge type of uh, or advocacy uh, in the space of AI, where you're empowering. That AI mm-hmm. to be able to book reservations, be able to find this mm-hmm. for you based on its knowledge of your intent yeah. and your particular preferences, right? Yeah, so that's that's where we get into a little bit of that uh, Skynet you're talking about, <laughs> where my robot's talking to your robot to set up an t- appointment for us to get together and, and get lunch. And by the way, my robot went ahead and paid for lunch on my credit card, which... A Capital One approved and already applied my sky miles to my next flight to come see you. It's like, what? Oh, <laughs> so, yes. It, 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 it's bound to happen. You know. That. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so how can small businesses compete in the upcoming shift to voice in AI? Mm. Mm, Good question. It depends on the business. Um, I will say that your local businesses are going to have their concerns that they're always going to have to be focused on from a local perspective. So if you're a if you're a local business, let's say again, a HVAC company here in Sarasota, Florida, you're going to need to be focusing very carefully on what it is that Google's doing with Google Maps um, and any kind of local search results that are coming up. Mm -hmm. I would look at probably some of the top um, review sites out there. Of course, Google is one of them, but Yelp is another. Uh, you know, if you're a, a restaurant or something like that in town, TripAdvisor or a hotel or something like that, these sites are always going to be important and popular for you to to build good brand relationship with. Because I think in the long run, those kinds of things will continue to influence results depending on where searches are occurring. Um, companies like TripAdvisor and things like that, if Google finds a way to not even you know, play with that kind of tool anymore. Uh, companies like TripAdvisor are going to have to seek acquisition somehow and and play into someone else's algorithm in order to to exit and and to still be relevant as a as a company in an operation because they have something valuable going on there. Um, that said, I really think that the best thing that uh, you could do is first of all, it depends on your industry, depends on your target audience. Um, but the, we can go all the way back to the core basics of marketing, really. Um, I think start with why. You know, read Simon's the next book. Start with why. Figure out your purpose as a company, why you exist. Uh, and then second of all, figure out who your tribes are. Read that book, Tribes, by Seth Godin. Figure out, all right, so we know what our why is and we know who we're talking to. Uh, you're Once killing you've... me, Smalls. Those two, those two books are the books I give away to, to oh, our clients, man. man. That's awesome. Yes, that's great, dude. That's, that's what I recommend to everybody. I yep. mean, like, once you do number one, start with why number two who you know that's your tribe uh man everything else gets so much easier after that you know what to say when to say it where to say it everything else becomes so much easier and that is marketing that's really it those are the bibles they really are and and uh those are disciplines however because it's a lot easy a lot easier to just focus on the what's and the how's Right, right. And and marketers uh, have this knee-jerk reaction because it's something shiny, right. you know? Uh, Facebook ads rolls out a new da, 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 whatever, who cares? And everybody jumps on it. But I'm like, wait, do you know why you're doing this, who you're talking to? Like, <laughs> if you don't know those, it doesn't matter what you say. You're just going <laughs> to blow money. <laughs> well, our Facebook audience certainly uh, uh, likes uh, what, you're, what you're talking about here. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the concept of, of SEO and technical SEO uh, has been beaten around uh, for the for the last five years, and and had to play second fiddle to social media, to sure. engagement factors, and 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 why stories um, that those marketing principles are are paramount, and mm-hmm. uh, we're starting to see a, a reemergence of the technical SEO skill set that needs to mm-hmm. be embraced by. Other marketers that hadn't seen that lane before, they're starting to realize that they can get a heck of a lot more amplification with everything that they do as long as they get into those, the analyses plus execution from a coding level, right? Sure, absolutely, man. I mean, so I teach SEO all the time, not just to clients, but to, I'm a mentor to a lot of different business owners and friends, and uh, I actually teach at a, a university here in in um, South Florida. And um, what I what I always start with is a a very simple framework of SEO, we have technical, we have content, and we have offsite. 
and I, I, I offsite's the most general category, really, but technical is always going to be a component in search engine optimization. Technical is always going to be there. Content is always going to be there because that's what people are looking for. I don't care what it is, text, images, video, audio. That's it. Whatever is it? That's all content. So, uh, and then offsite is trust factors really that are outside of your direct control uh, from a from a direct perspective. Like, can you directly manipulate offsite factors? Um, and and that's really you know the, the final frontier I think of of search and so far as the ranking algorithm uh, ranking factors go. But regardless, you are seeing this resurgence in technical because you're seeing um, the technical developments in the web generally you know i mean we've got things like react now and sites being built on that uh, that people are having to figure out just how to get that to work properly you know we've got incredible new things happening from a usability perspective but at the same time we also have awful things happening from a usability perspective because this new technology is so powerful mm -hmm. you know when flash first came out back in the day a lot of people were jumping on it because it was such a cool tool a lot of people were saying oh it's great usability because you can really draw every little thing and create an entire environment that's cool but if you're a bad designer you can also make an awful environment out of it so <laughs> just the tool set it's agnostic you know yep no, no, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Well, you actually wrote an ebook uh, out there called The Anatomy of SEO. Can you tell us how this came to be and why it was written? Sure, yeah. I, I find myself saying that little framework over and over again, the whole technical content and offsite uh, framework of SEO, because that's really what it boils down to. You tell me anything in the SEO industry, any ranking factor whatsoever, and I will find a place in that framework where that belongs. Um, and, and as of recent, I'm probably gonna have to update that just a little bit more because of some new and in, interesting usability, clickstream related stuff that's starting to influence the rankings a little bit more. Hmm. But that'll probably go in the offsite category. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but regardless, um, that framework, I find myself saying over and over again to take someone from zero to 100 miles an hour in terms of understanding SEO and then from that framework, I'm able to look at any website and just quickly dock points if uh, their technical is not in order or their technical is in great shape. It's a, it's a clean engine, but the content just isn't there or their technical and content's there, but nobody's heard of them because they don't have any links. They're not doing any PR or, or social media or anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. It's always an area of weakness in regards to SEO, even if you're at the very top of your game and you're one of the top two competitors in your industry and you're a Fortune 5 corporation, you still have a weakness in one of those three areas. You could always be better in one of those three areas. There so it is. Yeah. That's that's where, you know, uh, us at Simple Tiger, we're, it's it's a jungle out there. That's the attitude. We're always like uh <laughs> We're always trying to help our, our clients overcome some of those challenges. I love it. I love it. And uh, I'll ask my uh, our social media manager, Tyler, to actually uh, pull that uh, ebook in into the uh, uh, the Facebook uh, stream to be able to throw a link to our audience. And we certainly want to have that in the show notes. It sounds great that, that you've been able to provide that level of, of content for education, but also understanding the gaps and understanding... Right, right how to be introspective into, okay, you may be doing it good over here, but we've got an equalizer bar when it comes down to technical SEO mm -hmm. that's not only grouped by thirds, there's a heck of a lot of segmentation in each particular bus. <laughs> right, <laughs> For, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you could start an a an agency today on just one of those three subjects. That's what I love about SEO. There is, it is. Yeah. Let, let's say worst case scenario. For some reason, I can't see, but the the SEO industry does come to an end. Stop let's it. Just stop it. Total, stop it. I, no, yeah, I know. <laughs> That total hypothetical. But those are three sub industries that you and I could easily jump into right now yep. with dominance and strength. You know, um, that that have their own ways of making money that don't require SEO. No, so you're, you're absolutely right. Um, now, and this, you know, this is this is this ebook was targeted towards SaaS companies. So, what are some of the biggest technical SEO mistakes that you ha you see happen in the SA in SaaS websites? Sure. Yeah. So I find that a lot of SaaS companies are built, first of all, the, the website and everything is built from an engineering first perspective. Um, so the engineers are really interested. The ones who built the software are probably the ones who also build the website. Yeah. Um, and that totally makes sense. That's what I would do if I had, if I owned a SaaS company, I would, you know, you guys built a, an incredible software. You could probably build a measly website, but uh, we really <laughs> actually, we really actually need our measly website to kind of be a rock star. It's got to be a salesperson. It's got to yeah. be more uh, more than just a website. So um, so that's the first thing. And what that usually means is that there tends to not be enough content on the SaaS websites. Um, there are you know, features, pricing, 
sign up. Right. You know, it's like pretty much all there is. And I'm like, oh, come on, man. There's so many more opportunities to talk about what you guys can do and who you can do it for. Mm -hmm. That's like my favorite single thing. I always love the metrics that SaaS companies have. We can go in real quick and figure out who is using their software and then go produce content for those people and say, man, like, for example, QuickBooks, uh, you know, uh, that works really great for like certain industries. Like if you're a landscaping company, we should talk about how you should use QuickBooks for landscaping. And then, mm. bam, now you've got, you know, landscaping invoicing software content and stuff like that. That's just very targeted and people are just going to eat it, you know? And yeah, so yeah. We talk to any software as a service company, we always look first at like their why they exist, but then their tribes and if they're talking to their tribes or not. So, so there's the buyer's journey and then there's the user persona, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding right. your users and being able to break down the, the pain points, the triggers, what the what the issues are that they're trying mm -hmm. to solve. It's not exactly. just a buy here, pay here because we're the shit. Said so. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You, you've got to empathize with their pain and got to be able to bring sure. content to match their intent and then be able to ferry them through. Right. Yep. Yep. And that's where I love qualitative analytics, something you and I were talking about before the show. Mm -hmm. I love uh, Will Reynolds at uh, Sierra Interactive. He's always talking about qualitative analytics and using things like Hotjar and tools like that to collect uh, real time user data to get an idea of what people's concerns are, and what they want to see and the content they're actually looking for and using that data to actually inform your marketing efforts and create the content your users are looking for. That's that's how you do it, folks. Sure. <laughs> Just pay attention there. So what are some tips that you can share with uh, SaaS companies on how to build inbound links and inbound value? Because that's the most elusive mm -hmm. and most challenging space, right? Sure, sure. So the first thing that I always recommend SaaS companies do is come up with something proprietary that other people aren't going to get uh, or, or easily acquire. So one that we see all the time is, quite frankly, you guys have a lot of cool data. Can you spin that data into something, into uh, you know some some piece of information like an infographic or a compendium of of, of research or, or you know knowledge base of information on how to do something um, that then is very. Uh, exciting to link to, like something that you would be proud to share on Facebook, not just today because you want to get it out there, but like every time somebody brings up a question, you're like, I've got a link for you and you shoot it over. If that's the kind of thing that you find yourself always sharing, guess what? That's the kind of thing that can get a lot of links around the web. You do a small PR effort, you put that in front of the right people, in front of the right places and publications, you'll get links to that stuff. You talk to the right bloggers and the right influencers on Twitter and on Instagram and things like that, you'll get links to that kind of stuff. It just, it, it really does work. Um, so I would highly recommend starting there, come up with something proprietary, some secret sauce, some data, some way of explaining something, uh, publish that as content on your site, and then get out there and find people who will link to it. Um, there's an inverse way of doing that too, which I also recommend, which is start by talking to people out around the web on Twitter and things like that in your industry and find out what is missing. Once hmm. you find out what is missing, then go create that piece of content and go back to them and say, here it is. Exploit so. the gap, find the gap exactly. and, be, and be able to just run straight through it with as much uh, uh, useful information to be able to connect the dots. Fantastic. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Hey, well, that sounds easy, but I mean, there are challenges there and you got to be able sure. to have the discipline that you're not going to see immediate payoffs. But I mean, right. if you move social, move content, move inbound, move uh, uh, SEM, all in those spaces e and move your email. I mean, it's all got to be consistently messaging into that space, right? Mm -hmm. Then you'll yeah. reap the rewards. You, and from for digital marketers, you got to not just try one space and think that you've solved the equation or it just didn't work. For companies, yeah. for organizations that hire marketers, you got to give a little bit of grace and understanding that you've they, that there's got to be multiple channels to be able to communicate that gap, right? Right, right, exactly. And, uh, you know, I always talk to companies who are, so So we deal with a, a broad range of SaaS companies, uh, companies who are just getting started. It's one engineer, one developer, and it's, it's his little company, uh, all the way through to, um, Companies that have been around maybe a decade and they've got a ton of a ton of employees, big software, lots of tools. So they're different sizes and everything. And so I'm always talking about where uh, or when you need to get into SEO, for example. You know, um, uh, that's probably one of the biggest common questions that we get is when should I do SEO? Um, I don't like for people to invest in SEO too early when they need to think about next month and how they're going to survive to next month. 
if you're trying to survive the next month, yeah. SEO is not what you need to be doing. You should be doing a paid search, paid social, something, something demand that you can jump into immediately. Um, and then when you can actually say, I can make it six to nine months spending three to five grand a month without, you know, looking for a reward right away, that's a comfortable, that's a comfortable budget, comfortable range to actually jump into SEO. And lo and behold, the companies that do that tend to reap benefits a lot sooner than that. It's mm -hmm. just nice knowing that you have that security blanket that you can make it a while if, if you needed to, because SEO is a marathon, not a spread. Oh man, I couldn't have said that better myself. That is, <laughs> I, I, we're going to replay just that clip <laughs> whenever we're onboarding new business. They got to know that it's an investment and it yeah. won't pay off immediately. And if if you're not up for it, then the SEO is not your silver bullet. And in fact, there is no silver bullet. You got to mm. be able to to be able to invest in short gains and long gains. You, you, you've got to understand your consumer more than where you want to rank a trophy word, right? That's right. That's right, man. I got the battle scars and the gray hair to prove all that. <laughs> you and me, you and me both. Well, I, uh, Jeremiah has been a pleasure um, uh, talking. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we could un unfold this for hours, but sure. I'd, I'd love to get your insight on what bugs you about your industry right now. Hmm. What bugs me about my industry right now definitely is the knee jerk reaction to focus all of our efforts on the brand new thing that just happened, mm -hmm. like voice search. Um, and let's neglect everything we know from the past uh, 100 years of how humans have operated in terms of buying things or even thousand years, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, social psychology is really, um, I think, quite frankly, just another way of saying marketing, but marketing is just doing it with lots of people instead of one. Um, so really, I want us to get back to the basics, mm. honestly, uh, you know, you and I talked about start with why and tribes. If all of the SEO people that jumped on voice search or this or that or whatever pops up at any given moment um, would just take their time and, and go back and read those two books and just remember that at the beginning, what is your purpose and who are you talking to? You'll start figuring out what to do and, and those things actually may become either irrelevant or less relevant or you might find a strategy within those realms and find a new comfort dealing with voice search or artificial intelligence or something like that uh, and, and just know where to place it in terms of your list of concerns for the day um uh, you know I, I i want that to change I, i'm good at filtering out the sky is falling content just like you are because we've been in the industry so long but i do see new people stepping into the industry which we need um, and uh, and they're getting confused. Yeah. It's not, so I'm, I'm here to help uh, change that and clarify and, and make things simpler and, and educate the community. You're, uh, you're preaching to the choir, man, and uh, you, you, you're, you're doing the good work there because that, <laughs> that needs to be um, um, continually uh, focused on because we have new generations of marketers coming through, and they've got to be prepared on, on what's, what you should be paying attention to not what's top of mind and trending right now. You've got to have that core foundation, right? Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, that core foundation is critical. I mean, uh, I saw, a, I can't remember where I saw this recently, but it was a really interesting video where they took some of the original admin from Madison Avenue um, from the 50s and they brought them into some new, I think it was, uh, I think it was actually a uh, Ogilvy or Ogilvy, I can't mm -hmm. remember how to pronounce that, but they brought them in there with all of the new technology and everything and said, let's throw together an ad campaign. And these old dudes were like getting upset at these young bucks for saying, you're focused too much on your technology. You're not remembering the core Oof. people and why we're trying to do. And they did the whole buy a friend to Coke thing. And that was the campaign these, these old dudes came up with. And they had these vending machines where you could go up to a vending machine and connect you with someone else on the other end, you buy each other a Coke. Huh. So when you put your dollar in, they're getting your dollar coke and you're getting their dollar coke and it, it it's just there's just a moment there's a social moment and it it worked really well but I, I just love seeing that because it reminds me to get back to the basics of what we're trying to do you gotta know, you gotta know who you're trying to reach and what their pain is right yeah uh we uh, we we hearken to maslow's hierarchy of needs all the time and mm. and that is marketing you got to meet them where they're experiencing pain where they're experiencing their education towards a solution and what mm -hmm. the comparative nature is there. And on top of that, when they've picked their pony, what do they get from committing to that as a decision making? There's so much content in each and every one of those stages, but you got to know where their pain starts, right? 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. People are driven by pain, uh, you know, avoiding pain or seeking pleasure. And so if, uh, you know, you can figure out what people, what, what their triggers are, uh, you can figure that out qualitatively. Are people in your industry, like, for example, if it's a personal injury attorney, well, pretty much they are avoiding pain. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, if uh, it is vacation rentals, they are seeking pleasure. Yeah. So that totally frames how you're going to communicate with them. And Amen. I think that really helps a lot. Well, uh, to, to finish up here, let us know what excites you about the industry that you're in right now. I love waking up every day and seeing something a little bit different. That's always been fun for me. Variety is the spice of life. Um, I love teaching. So there's always something new to be teaching in this industry because there's always something I'm learning in this industry. Um, so it, it really, I think those two things right there, I mean, they're, they're really one and the same thing, I guess. They, that just excites me all the time. As, as long as something is fresh and new, I love playing with it. And when I get to see the real world impact of it, hmm. and I close my laptop at the end of the day, and I go out there and hang out with friends, and bam, there I am using Google and everything. I'm like, oh, this is awesome, man. I just love being a part of this world. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very happy man, isn't he? I'm a happy man. <laughs> well, we're gonna have we're gonna have to have you come back and talk about uh, uh, the fully remote team and what you do in that space, yeah. because there there there's there's I shouldn't say contention. There's always um, I mean, as we're as we're more into digital nomads that mm -hmm. that I mean that's a whole other area of of discussion that and we've had conversations with different uh, agency owners before and how they're they're finding their way through that type of relationship. So uh, if right. you're up for it, we'd love to have you back talking about that. I would love to. That's a that's a subject I'm very passionate about. I can go deeper into the philosophy and stuff like that on that. But yeah, I'd yeah, love yeah. to. That sounds great. Something, uh, I, this is weird, Jeremiah, because um, uh, we, we always ask our, our guests to kind of fill out a questionnaire uh, before mm -hmm. they get on so we know uh, some of their key points. One of the fun points that you, you talked about, dude, I actually shared the exact same thing. You share with our audience, uh, what was your fun point there? Uh, let's see. I, I've, I got it, I've got it right in front of me. Yeah, I can't remember which one. You're a college dropout, so am I. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That's the one that was like for the longest time I was nervous about because yeah. this this is all I got, man. <laughs> but no, I love it. So yeah, I'm a college dropout. I uh, I was going to, uh, to school for one semester. My goal when I started school was to eventually go to Georgia Tech uh, to be a robotics engineer. And I did not have the math scores. I did not have the acumen to do that. And eventually just realized it's just not going to happen. Yep. So I left there and ended up stumbling into search engine optimization, which just so <laughs> happens to be robotics engineering in some crazy way. And uh, now I'm teaching at the University of South Florida, um, senior level marketing students, and I don't have a college degree. It's a bizarre world we're living in, my man. No, it's, and, and you know what? It's, it's, it's cool because if you've got enough tenacity and if you've got enough persistence, right, that's going mm -hmm. to far push past any type of degree. And, and, and honestly, I mean, not to get into that entire space, but it's, it's it, uh, employers look mm -hmm. at your successes, look at what you're trying yeah. to achieve. And in this world now, mm -hmm. that's not necessary. As long as right. you stick to it and you show grit uh, right. in an in, in industry or in, in a particular profession, that's mm -hmm. coming to the surface more and more. I mean, I, I don't want to say you know, conventional education is antiquated, sure. antiquated sure. but uh, my gosh, I mean, there's, yeah. there's something there, man. It needs disruption. That's basically what it needs. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah. I think it's happening. It's it's happening. It's coming. I'm part of that. Um, and I'm seeing part of that happen in front of me right now. And I, and I love it. The fact that I'm actually able to teach. Here's what I love. Hmm. I'm able to teach SEO in a university. SEO is being taught in university. Thank God. Huzzah. My, you know, <laughs> like that is exciting to me. I'm happy to be a part of that. You know, we actually have a relationship with a, a college up in Fort Wayne, Ball State University, and they actually have an entire analytics, social and digital marketing analytics course, mm. which That's is awesome. amazing. And they actually have students running their own uh, agency there, and, wow. they're, and they're delivering and delivering execution for the local community businesses. That's brilliant. The yeah, evolution man. of of this inside of our collegiate environments is, is just fantastic to be able to see. Yeah. It is. Yeah, we teamed up with uh, um, a, a couple of friends of mine and I who are all teaching at USF now. We teamed up with the uh, Gulf Coast uh, CEO Forum down here, which is a forum of about 100 local CEOs of, of corporations here in town. Hmm. So we presented to them that we are teaching senior level marketing students digital marketing plans this year at USF. Would any of you like 
to submit your business to get a free digital marketing plan from our students. Now, when, and it, so we got a lot of submissions, like 20 or 30 of them, which was way too many. And so we said, okay, second round of questions, would you be interested in offering them an internship? And so that, that list got a little shorter and they were like, okay, third round of questions here, and this is it. Would you be willing to hire any of them when they come out of college? And we got a Finally, five companies were like, yeah, we'd be open to hiring someone who is on your team. So then we presented that to the class and boy, it, it turned into a free for all people trying to get, you know, clients and everything. And now, they're, <laughs> now we're going to teach them digital marketing plans and they're actually doing it for businesses here in town. It's oh, that's, awesome. see, that's it. Right? That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Well, is there anything that we could promote for you on the show today? Uh, no, I mean, I, th I think uh, really I would love uh, just for your users to check out our uh, Anatomy of SEO guide. I think that's a pretty cool book. If you're ever interested in just kind of getting a deeper understanding of search engine optimization, starting from zero and, and taking you straight on through to a, a, a well, un, you know, a good breadth of knowledge on SEO to begin with and having a healthy foundation, then you could dive much deeper from there. I think if your users are interested in checking that out, I'd love to uh, love to give that to them. Yep. So we uh, threw the link uh, in the, the Facebook stream. We're certainly going to put that on the show notes and we'll, we've been lifting up on social media. So hopefully we can get more and more people educated. There it is on the screen, connect.simpletiger.com. Uh, forward slash anatomy and uh, for our uh, audio audience uh, you certainly want to go check out the show notes and you'll have all the links right there you can actually follow jeremiah on his twitter handle at jeremiah c smith uh facebook on simple tiger uh linkedin jeremiah smith and uh those are the socials uh any last words for digital marketers for the future and to be able to future proof their work ah uh, yeah um I, this this marketing axiom that I love so much: uh, be clear, not clever; be different, not better. I just I love that. I think it's just such a simple thing. You do that in everything that you do, and it will work from a marketing perspective. It will work. So I just awesome. leave you with a little nugget of wisdom there. <laughs> well, Jeremiah, thank you so much, and thanks for coming back and returning after we had some technical difficulties last week. Enjoy the conversation immensely. So uh, kudos to you, and uh, we certainly want to to lift you up on socials. Uh, you're doing the Doing good work, man, and you're right in the sweet spot of the lane of technical SEO. I really uh, appreciate what you're doing, and uh, it's killer, dude. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here and, and highlighting people like myself. It's a it's a real blessing and an honor to be on your show. I uh, really in, enjoyed talking to you today. I'd be happy to come back anytime. So awesome. thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks for listening to Edge of the Web Radio. Special thank you to all of our colleagues at Site Strategics. Again, if you're interested in uh, what we can do for you from a digital marketing return on investment report, go check out offer.sitestrategics.com forward slash uh, edge and you can jump right in there no obligation just find out what we can do for you in that space uh, special thank you to our guest jeremiah smith make sure you check out all the must-see videos and all the audio uh at edge of the web radio.com be sure to rate us and give us some reviews if you like what you're hearing over on itunes google play stitcher Podbean. uh what else do we have out there all the platforms, uh, yeah, Overcast, uh, Player FM, Spotify, Spotify we're, yep. we're, we're all in. the places. Tune in, so uh, you, you can't swing a dead can't not and not hit <laughs> uh, <laughs> a podcast platform we're on. But if we're not on your favorite, let us know and we'll get our stream there. So special thanks there for to, to Tom producing the show today. Uh, be sure to to listen to all of our shows and uh, if you want to have us talk to somebody that you're interested in hearing from, just drop us a note. So uh, this is Aaron speaking for Tom. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye.